The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells Book 1 The Coming of the Martians Chapter 3 On H.O.R.S.E.L.L. Common I found a crowd of perhaps twenty people surrounding the hole in which the cylinder lay. I have already described the appearance of that colossal bulk embedded in the ground. The turf and gravel about it seemed charred by an explosion. No doubt its impact had caused a flash of fire. Henderson and Ogilvy were not there. They perceived nothing to be done for the present and had gone to breakfast at Henderson's house. Four or five boys were sitting on the edge of the pit, with their feet dangling and amusing themselves until I stopped them by throwing stones at the giant mass. After I had spoken to them about it, they began playing a touch in and out of the group of bystanders. Among these were a couple of cyclists, a jobbing gardener I sometimes employed, a girl carrying a baby, Greg the butcher and his little boy, and two or three loafers and golf caddies who were accustomed to hanging about the railway station. There was very little talking. Few of the ordinary people in England had anything but the vaguest astronomical ideas in those days. Most of them were staring quietly at the big table-like end of the cylinder, which was still as Ogilvy and Henderson had left it. The widespread expectation of a heap of chod corpses was disappointed at this inanimate bulk. Some went away while I was there, and other people came. I clambered into the pit and fancied I heard a faint movement under my feet. The top had indeed ceased to rotate. It was only when I got this close to it that this object's strangeness was evident to me. At first glance, it was no more exciting than an overturned carriage or a tree blown across the road. Not so much so, indeed. It looked like a rusty gas float. It required a certain amount of scientific education to perceive that the grey scale of the thing was no common oxide and that the yellowish-white metal that gleamed in the crack between the lid and the cylinder had an unfamiliar hue. Extraterrestrial had no meaning for most of the onlookers. At that time, it was clear that the thing had come from Mars, but I judged it improbable that it contained any living creature. The unscrewing might be automatic. Despite Ogilvy, I still believed there were men on Mars. My mind ran fancifully on the possibilities of its containing manuscript, the difficulties in translation that might arise, whether we should find coins and models in it, and so forth. Yet it needed to be more significant for assurance of this idea. I felt the impatience to see it opened. At about eleven, as nothing seemed to be happening, I walked back to my Mayberry home full of such thoughts. But I needed help to get to work on my abstract investigations. In the afternoon, the appearance of the common had altered very much. The early editions of the evening papers had startled London with enormous headlines. A message received from Mars. Remarkable story from WOKING, and so forth. In addition, Ogilvy's wire to the astronomical exchange had roused every observatory in the three kingdoms. Half a dozen flies from the Woking station stood in the road by the sand pits, a basket chaise from Chobham, and a rather lordly carriage. Besides that, there was quite a heap of bicycles. In addition, many people must have walked, despite the heat of the day, from Woking and Chertsey so that there was quite a considerable crowd, one or two gaily dressed ladies among the others. It was glaringly hot, not a cloud in the sky nor a breath of wind and the only shadow was that of the few scattered pine trees. The burning heather had been extinguished, but the level ground towards Otter Shore was blackened as far as one could see, still giving off vertical streamers of smoke. An enterprising sweet stuff dealer in the Chobham Road had sent up his son with a barrow load of green apples and ginger beer. Going to the edge of the pit, I found it occupied by a group of about half a dozen men Henderson, Ogilvy, and a tall, fair-haired man that I afterward learned was Stent, the Astronomer Royal, 
with several workers wielding spades and pickaxes. Stent was giving directions in a clear, high-pitched voice. He was standing on the cylinder, which was now much more relaxed. His face was crimson and streaming with sweat, and something seemed to have irritated him. A large portion of the cylinder had been uncovered, though its lower end was still embedded. As soon as Ogilvy saw me among the staring crowd on the edge of the pit, he called to me to come down and asked me if I would mind going over to see Lord Hilton, the Lord of the Manor. The growing crowd, he said, was becoming a serious impediment to their excavations, especially the boys. They wanted a light railing put up and help to keep the people back. He told me that a faint stirring was occasionally still audible within the case, but the workers had failed to unscrew the top, as it afforded no grip to them. The issue appeared to be enormously thick, and the faint sounds we heard might have represented a noisy tumult in the interior. I was happy to do as he asked to become a privileged spectator in the contemplated enclosure. I failed to find Lord Hilton at his house, but I was told he was expected from London by the six o'clock train from Waterloo. And as it was then about a quarter past five, I went home, had some tea, and walked up to the station to waylay him. That is the end of chapter three. Thanks for listening, and I will see you in chapter four.